Hi, welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics. I've long ago lost track of what episode we're on, but I don't think that really matters. Um, today I have some fun guests. I have part of my, what was once my regular panel before I became a flaky person in the United to make money. And I have some new people and, well, all right, let's introduce them. We have Joe, who is my brother and is in a band, which he never describes on the internet, and I think he should brag about a lot more. Um, we have Michelle Montalvo, who is, as her lower third says, no longer an intern, which is an important thing to no longer be. Um, we have my headphones being crappy. And we have Jordan Bloom, who is the opinions editor for the Daily Caller and has a blog that I can't pronounce the name of and never will be able to. <laughs> never. Um, and our first uh, virgin guest, no offense, Todd, um, Todd Seedy, who writes things and lives in New York and is pretty awesome. Though he, I like to yell at him about some of his opinions sometimes, but hopefully he doesn't take it personally. Um, welcome, panel. I think I've forgotten how to do this, but not really, because this is going to be fun. Okay. Um, what are we going to talk about first? I have a list of things. Um, you're, the you're the boss, Lucy. You tell us. You yeah, tell I know. Us. You're the worst co-host ever, Joe. It's true. All right. I want to talk about the Nobel Peace Prize and how they gave it to um, well, I should, Malala Yousaf. Oh, God, I hope that's right, because that would be <laughs> really That's terrible. No? Okay. White privilege, Lucy. <laughs> Pronouncing things is hard, Joe. Okay. The Nobel Peace Prize is, I feel like for once they gave it to somebody who they should give it to, which is like a well-intentioned person who has struggled in a foreign land. And admittedly, she at least, you know, told Obama that drones are probably bad and are probably making more terrorists. So she's not like sort of a default feel-good kind of figure. Also, you know, getting shot by the Taliban is pretty legit and surviving it is even better. Joe, is the Nobel Peace Prize super dumb considering that a man who has technically killed several hundred Middle Eastern children um, got it several years before a Middle Eastern teenager did? Uh, yeah, it's pretty much a joke. I mean, we had Obama in 2009. In 2007, we had Al Gore win it, along with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And oh, yeah, that used years. to be the joke about it, yeah. Right. Al Gore. We, we moved on to insulting Obama, but... You know, the European Union won it in 2012. It's just, I mean... Wait, really? It, it has to be. That's not a, yeah. That can't... Wait, really? Yeah. How can, yeah. How can the European... I don't even understand how that works. Henry Kissinger and Yasser Arafat have been winners, and a century ago, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson uh, were winners as well. Yeah. So basically, it's an exception when it makes any semblance of sense. It's It's been a joke for 100 years, so, I mean... Does anyone really care anymore about who wins it? It doesn't seem to have quite the cachet that it used to. Um, I feel like yes and no. I mean, like I am, you know, I am perpetuating its being a thing by talking about it. But like it, you know, <clears throat> it appears in the headlines and people talk about it, and it's still annoying. So I don't know. It's yeah. It's a. It's bad. It's bad. So. We could talk about we could talk about new things because I feel like we're all pretty uh, sure that it's a bad bad prize. Um, is Ebola going to us all? Joe, you're going to be my co-host. You're going to be my productive co-host, whether you like it or not. Every right. time I look at Drudge Report, I feel actually really at ease because I figure that if Drudge is overhyping something, it's not we're not all going to die of Ebola. Um, that may be my contrarian nature, though. I think my former coworkers at the American Council on Science and Health uh, might have the right attitude, uh, which is that panic is never a good thing. However, it's a safe bet the government will handle it badly. Uh, <laughs> so the, the current plan appears to be to screen at five major airports, uh, but they're going to mainly screen for people with high fevers. If they're not yet symptomatic with Ebola, this won't accomplish anything. Uh, but it will mean the sequestering for long periods of lots and lots of people with the flu uh, yeah. or bad allergies and so forth. Um, so 
Uh, of course, don't panic, and you know, keep keep washing your hands, and don't expect the world to be filled with uh, killer zombies. But I wouldn't be shocked if it all goes to hell very quickly, and the government has no competent response. <laughs> I've seen it's now something many times. you can't talk about on a plane. Uh, I didn't <laughs> read the article, but yeah, there was a man on an outgoing Philly flight who uh, was taken off the plane <laughs> after sneezing and making a bola joke. So don't airports are not a place, or planes just never joke about anything. Like yeah. anything, that's just They're terrible. Literally, places. that's the rule of life now. Yeah. Uh, beer. It, it is interesting to me that uh, the thing that sort of put Ebola on the map in uh, popular consciousness was uh, almost exactly 20 years ago when the book *The Hot Zone* came out, and that got lots of praise from mainstream press across the political spectrum, uh, and basically made it sound like if there are a few cases in major metropolitan Western cities. Uh, it's the end of the world. Uh, 20 years later, people don't seem to be as panicked as they were, were then, and I suppose it's mainly because uh, the statistics back then, well, based mostly on 1970s outbreaks when it was first discovered, uh, suggested that the death rate would be 90% amongst people who contracted the virus. I and thought now, there was a strain where it was higher than it's been. But maybe uh, that's why I think that. Well, there are four different types, right? That's what they've been talking about. But the one that seems to be spreading is kind of virulent. But I was talking to one of my colleagues uh, two nights ago, and uh, and it was you know he sort of jokingly offered the theory that Ebola is sort of retribution for a nation that doesn't ever wash its hands, and, <laughs> and I pointed out to him that uh, you know there's a significant difference between a nation that doesn't wash its hands and a nation that doesn't use toilet paper, and that's sort of the the distinction in how uh, you know it might spread here versus West Africa. So this is for all the OCD people just to cry about forever. And myself being semi-included in that. God, where's my hand sanitizer? This is all the more reason to feel proud. <laughs> I guess you're, so, you're a, yeah. mark of, you're a mark of a superior civilization. American exceptionalism, finally, it is actually a thing. Oh, we're being, no, I don't know. And we've got vaccines to worry about, too. You know, people... You, and, and all the autism that results. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? I've heard the internet. <laughs> the internet. Yeah. With improved treatment, it looks like the death rate, even amongst uh, the uh, pockets in Africa, is down to 50%. So we're getting better at treating it, which could make a big difference. It was like 90% amongst those first people who contracted it in the 70s. Uh, but we're getting a little better at giving people fluids and so forth. It's um, kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it hasn't been, sp it's spreading fast enough to kind of keep the news cycle, which is, uh, I don't know, kind of a, well, I guess it kind of has with the, with the Dallas patient and everything, but it seems like the, um, the, the way we talk about Ebola is moving a lot faster with, like, the Ebola Chan thing, and uh, there was that story that, that I saw picked up in places I didn't see it, that I didn't expect to see it. It was, uh, it, supposedly the CDC said that the virus that they were working on only worked for white people. And of course, like that's a very the the I mean the racial politics of Ebola are kind of horrifying, right? The how the how the Ebola chan jumped from uh, U.S. message boards to Nigerian ones, and how exactly that happened, whether it was an earnest Nigerian person picking up on it or someone. I, was, I missed all I missed all that. Can you explain the? Oh, um, uh, yeah. So Ebola chan being uh, it's like it's a meme that's a, a little anime uh, chick, but an avatar of death and pestilence. Uh, so, so she's got pigtails and like a, a lab coat, and uh, and the, at the end of the pigtails are these spirals that look like the virus, and uh, so they, they it started on 4chan of people posting these pictures of of the Ebola chan, uh, avatar and and saying if you don't say I love you Ebola chan you're gonna get Ebola, and uh, so naturally once this jump from American message or I guess. Uh, English-speaking message boards, Nigeria's English-speaking too, but actual West African uh, image boards. Um, the, the, it became clear that or, or, uh, it started to look like there was some sort of occult, uh, you know, witch doctory going on of you know Westerners try, hoping that you know try, hoping that Ebola would eliminate the black people. In other words, so Ebola is taking place with uh, uh, in the context of what Nick Land has called a, a, an occult race war. Uh, and that's, you know, obviously it's already impeded our ability to fight the virus in certain cases. Well, I mean, there was those aid workers who got slaughtered by basically right. panic malls a couple weeks ago. And if um, Jesse Walker were here, he would talk about, like, even in America, the, you know, the basis of the, of the, the paranoia that doctors are going to, you know, either mess with or not treat black people and, you know, 
there's then there's 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 all the unfortunate like historical basis for that kind of fear, even though it's obviously not you know real. But um, yeah, that's not good. Wasn't I was like, uh, sorry, I was gonna talk about Naomi Wolf for a second. Don't ever do that again. Oh, Never <laughs> interrupt me to talk about Naomi Wolf. That, uh, that story was so great. <laughs> that uh, wait, Joe, you you tell the story. Well, tell the tale, Joe. Go I'll on. have to. I don't exactly remember what she said about uh, Ebola, but um, I mean, she came out with this ridiculous conspiratorial. But the government's letting in deliberately. I believe, yeah, letting it in. Yeah, that, it was said. kind of incomprehensible, if I recall. It was like, it was, it was very crazy person on the internet -y, if I recall. I mean, it was insane because she tied it into with, like, ISIS and, like... Yeah, that's right. The question the authenticity of ISIS beheading videos. Yeah. Staged. And then she, like, the next day she came out with the... suggesting the U.S. was sending troops to West Africa, not to with Ebola, but to bring Ebola back to the U.S. to justify a military takeover of a Do they need to send troops to... Can they do, be more subtle about it if they were going to fetch Ebola? I mean, it's. I don't know how she came up with these things like back to back. Like she must have been. She uh, might she, just be reading uh, libertarian conspiracy theorist Alex Jones's website. Uh, I've noticed one slightly confusing thing about his site, which I like to look at just for amusement once in a while, uh, is uh, that sometimes the con conspiracy theories seem to contradict each other. Uh, so, That's always fun, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so the government is simultaneously doing nothing to prevent Ebola. Uh, it's exaggerating the threat of Ebola, and uh, it's also working to spread Ebola, I think, all <laughs> at the same time. And uh, it's hard to keep track, but something terrible is going on, apparently. Well, I, and I think in the case of the ISIS videos, what was setting off a lot of the conspiracy theorists is that one of the first sources for, uh, for the place uh, or the, where these videos came out was a, a rapid response um, media monitoring firm uh, just outside of D.C., um, but normally so, sort of a pro-Israel outfit. Uh, outfit like political, politically rapid response, anti-Islam, pro-Israel sort of narrative. That's the narrative, and so the suspicion obviously, be, you know, came, uh, you know, from the anti-Israel conspiratorial crowd that you know they had cooked this up, they had doctored the video or whatever. Of course, it's complete nonsense, but that's basically what Naomi Wolf was saying. But Jordan, I thought you were the anti-Israel conspiracy theorist <laughs> crowd. I mean, I've read the Washington Free Beacon. Right. Well, for some reason. You know, Goldfarb is a foreign agent. Uh, that's uh, that's not a conspiracy. Uh, Wolf Wolf also said, tying into her back-to-back -back conspiracies, her third big conspiracy conspiracy was that the Scottish independence referendum had been fake too. So, where she got all three of those at the same time? Yeah, and you, you kind of heard that from Ron Paul too. Ron Paul sort of uh, obliquely suggested. Uh, that that the Scottish referendum had been a little bit rigged, and I I'd, I'd be curious what That's you guys think about this. I, I'd be curious what you guys think about this. I ran a piece from Don Rasmussen, who is a former aide to uh, Ron Paul for a long time, and and he wrote this piece for me this week about uh, basically saying that Ron Paul has to do what Marine Le Pen did and disavow her father, his father, uh, because you know. Fuck that! Ron Paul's way better than Rand Paul. <laughs> But yeah, I said it. that's, that, that's I said not it. part of the cal calculation from Rand's perspective. And Ron still, at least from comments like this on, on the Scottish referendum, has still manifested a willingness to indulge these people. That oh, yeah. No, that's true. That's annoying. Rand. Yeah, and I, I, I think pragmatically, probably, would, I assume it would probably help Rand Paul get some more in life to distance himself from his dad more. Yeah, you know, getting I, like the ten Scott Hortons of the world who hate Rand Paul but love Ron Paul to vote for you is probably not how you win, you know, the White House. So that's probably true, but it's still a bummer. I would strongly encourage Rand Paul to just sort of chuckle condescendingly if people ask him about his dad and say, well, I'm not going to insult my father. <laughs> right, I mean, he that. should have, he sh if he wants to be that pragmatic, he should have like a, a line where he doesn't diss his dad, but tries to sort of, let's not talk about him, you know, I'm my own candidate, etc. Right, he needs like, to be without problem. having been forced to tra trash him. I mean, this is this is again this is brutally pragmatic politics, and I hate it all. And Ron Paul is better, but also, yeah. Ron yeah. Paul is a crazy conspiracy theorist, though you can't you can't deny that. And if you don't believe that, look at what he sounded like before his presidential campaigns in 2008 and 2012. I mean, there are 
long videos of him going on about how the Trilateral Commission secretly runs the world. He was not subtle about it until he had to be in recent years, and Rand Paul should distance himself from all of that. That's just true. It's not just pragmatic politics. Well, no, I mean, it is just pragmatic politics because we're talking about whether we want Rand Paul to win or, and obviously Rand Paul wants to win if he plans to run. But see, I care about war a lot more than you do, which is why I yell at you all the time, even though okay. I like you. Well, so, but as a person who cares about war, doesn't that, uh, you know, mean you have even more at stake making sure that anti-war views are presented in a way that's kind of palatable and sane? Yes. But at the same time, the pickings are so goddamn slim that I'm not going to toss out the Ron Paul with the Bilderberg or what have you. Because, like, I mean, you can't. Fair enough. Um, you know, my, my, my people at antiwar.com, you know, especially Justin Raimondo, who, you know, it, I, he writes shit that I disagree with often. He certainly, I certainly disagree with him on immigration and other stuff that I also care about, but... I also like that antiwar.com exists, you know. There's really, I was having a little chat with Angela Keaton from Antiwar on Twitter today about this, and I was just, with her palpable frustration about this, and it's like, there's, there's real, the pickings are just so slim when it comes to anti-war stuff. Like, do I, and I would still rather stand against, Ron, with Ron Paul and his conspiracy theories than with somebody like Medea Benjamin or people who are really anti-war and then want to go hug a dictator. I mean, I don't know. It's it's slim pickings out there. You just kind of gotta. You really have to be a little. That's kind of a false that. choice. That 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 really is a false choice, though, because I mean, there really there is a cadre of intellectuals in the Republican Party that do offer an alternative to what uh, to what we've got right now to the to the neocons. And it, the it, Rand Paul has just started to cozy up with these people. And the, and the neocons are obviously super nervous about it. I, I think I what people? I mean, don't never assume we're as smart as you are, dude, because it it just <laughs> provokes blinking. Well, I, I'm talking about like your your Brent Scowcroft types, the uh, people with respectable pedigrees, and and you know, uh, the actual ability to formulate a grand strategy for someone like Rand Paul. Okay. And, uh, they they're going to be nervous of him as long as he maintains his association with his father. Well, it would help if I knew who that was. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you really gotta get in down. The, the Dumb it down, will you? Well, so the uh, the Free Beacon had a story. It was a couple of weeks ago. It was about the um, the, the publisher of the National Interest, which is sort of the, the realist foreign policy journal in in, uh, in DC. Um, and it was about Dimitri Symes. Uh, did I mention that? Did we talk about this last time? I don't know, dude. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, anyway. So Alana Goodman, uh, she wrote the story, and uh, it, it was attacking Dimitri Symes, the publisher of the magazine, and this is Richard Nixon's hand-picked foreign policy heir uh, for uh, basically being a Russian simp. And he's advising Rand Paul, so it's a big deal, obviously, that Rand Paul is being advised by a Russian simp. And, uh, yeah, so, but, but I took that story to mean, the moment I saw it, is that, uh, you know, Rand Paul is making common cause with the realists and the neocons are going to do whatever they can to make sure that that doesn't happen or to fuck that up or whatever they can do to, you know, mess it up. And uh, I don't know. I think that, that alliance is a more hopeful thing than, you know, whether or not we ought to, you know, keep the cranks in the building or not. And to uh, uh, just give Lucy a footnote to what Jordan was saying, uh, Brent Scowcroft uh, would be taken seriously, most likely, because he served in important policy positions under four Republican presidents, including that being a uh, national security advisor uh, to two, including uh, Bush one. Um, so it wouldn't just be Rand Paul and a bunch of ignored cranks. It would be a reminder that he speaks to the mainstream. But, I mean, what is a foreign policy realist? I don't know exactly what that means in some objective way. Um, like, I just wrote a thing about how Obama is sort of better on foreign policy than Bush because Bush being a, a high watermark of completely fucking awful, slaughtering lots of people in the Middle East, blood on his hands kind of a way. So Obama isn't as bad as Bush, so shouldn't I be skipping around celebrating that he's not as bad as Bush? You know, I, I don't know what... I don't want to make the perfect be the enemy of the good, as my father has incessantly drummed into my head since I was a child, but... I don't want less dead people because of America. I would like none. I don't know. Well, here's the case. So you, I, I have serious doubts that non-interventionism is saleable to the American people. I mean, R Rand Paul is one terrorist back away from political oblivion. 
uh, the American people want shows of force. What the realist lend is sort of a realistic understanding of power relations as opposed to an ideological one. That's at least what they claim to offer. And yeah. uh, I think that's, uh, you know, a, a more sane and palatable thing that we've got today in the Republican Party. Well, most things would be, I suppose. Well, well, it's, just, it's, never, it's never going to motivate people. You, it, it, we're not going to, you know, go marching over the barricades like some anti-Vietnam protest into the White House. It's just not... That's not... Oh, I wanna! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, by the way, Lucy... Uh, I don't know if we can whittle down the war debate to a mere, like, three sentences, but just to put it in the clearest, starkest terms, uh, would you ideally like to have a pacifist in the White House who tells the world, we will never fight a war no matter what horrible things you do to us or to others? Just I don't to... know that saying it that baldly is necessarily um, productive, no. I'll agree okay. to that. Uh, well, of course, I don't know about, you know, maybe I want to burn the White House down. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> It Depends doesn't sound to me is. like Rand. Depends on how pragmatic I feel. It doesn't sound to me like Rand Paul has world conquest plans. It just sounds like he wants right. to wants to let the world uh, continue to think we retain military options. You know, that's all, which is probably a good idea. Well, retaining military options was certain, and doing nothing about that is certainly an improvement over the past century. So, yeah, I do. I mean, I honestly think that Rand Paul would probably be a significant improvement over most presidents of, you know, the past, again, century, but that doesn't mean I don't worry about, you know, turning into one of those earnest Obama people circa 2008 who was so excited for their guy to win and then being like, oh, wait, the real world and politics is horrible, etc. So I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, Just I noticed... Food. Just what, give it up, Jason. Stop trying. <laughs> Joe, uh, you're just here to bring us all down, Joe, in just a really non-specific sort of way. Just everything's terrible, right, Joe? I'm a nihilist. You are not, Chuck. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like Rand Paul. Again, I was kind of gonna bring him up anyway, and then it just happened, so that's good. Um, Rand Paul went down to Ferguson uh, yesterday, and he was down there today trying to be the Republican who cares about black people and prisons and the unfortunate correlation. Um, so like today, today I feel like all libertarians should be excited about Rand Paul, but presumably next week he's going to do something and everyone's going to hate him again, and that's kind of like the new circle of life. Um, so he's that. got such a balancing act to pull though with the different you know uh, interests in the Republican Party. You know he's got to appeal to everyone if he you know once if he even has a small chance of getting the nomination, he's got to appeal to the actual conservatives who are going to vote in the primaries, and then he's going to probably have to spin it a little bit towards the middle to win, you know, a general election. So he's he's in a tough place, I think, but I think it's good that he's, you know, he's, he still seems to be doing more good things than bad things, and at least he recognizes that, you know, black people have been, you know, unjustly kind of targeted by the police, and he's, you know, he's not ignoring them or kind of playing to the white supremacist southern strategy kind of stuff. Like his pa did. Uh, <laughs> right. Today. His pa sure. and pretty much everyone else in the conservative party. So, yeah, he's, he's good. I, I like him. I like him more than anyone else. He got something like a quarter of black voters uh, in his Senate when he uh, uh, was voted into the Senate, uh, which is uh, sadly something like five times as many I was going to say, that sounds like a lot, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah For by Republican standards, that's astonishing. So uh, I think he's already proving his ability to cobble together an unusual coalition. And after all, every winning president is going to have to cobble together some sort of national coalition out of different factions. It'd be really nice to have the basic template be a libertarian one for a change, and it looks like he's doing that. Yeah, I mean, and he's... His, it's like going down to Ferguson today and talking with NAACP people and all that sort of thing. It's a type of pandering and like a, a political move, but it's the kind that can result in people actually being helped. It's not purely like pounding the pulpit about this cause and that. He's actually pushing on an issue that has been, you know, the worst domestic policy decision since segregation, I would argue. Like, he's not just, you know, he's not pandering when it's convenient. The fact that he's actually pushing on criminal justice reform more than he ever needs to 
um, makes me like him when 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 he's disappointed me in all other areas. Um, oh. And he, he's never. He's, you guys later. <laughs> bye, Jordan. <laughs> right. He said he had to do something at six thirty. It's six twelve. Damn it. That was so wow. sudden. I mean, I don't think he's just like playing. Like he doesn't seem to be just like Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, where it's just like, oh, this is kind of. I know I have to talk about this to get the, you know, the right. Rally. The black leader, uh, he's more down on the war on drugs and and prison than more than, than all of those or, people. Yeah. Or Obama ever was. I mean, Obama. He never. I guess he. Dude, Obama's following his lead. But he's like. They're following him. They're following like the wind, winds blowing and making it acceptable to talk about this. Like, right. Grand Paul said more in the past two months than Obama ever had, and you know Obama was supposed to be, you know, you'd think at least he would try and advance, you know, some of the things that might actually help out black people in America instead of continuing federal raids on marijuana and all the other, you know, stuff that he's doing. That's, you know, he could actually be doing good. In this kind of, this is the kind of thing where, you know, some of the the liberals and even libertarians maybe thought back in the day that, well, you know, at least Obama will be good on this kind of stuff. You know, well, him and Holder stuff. have improved on it on drug stuff lately. Like they took their sweet time. They absolutely followed once it was more acceptable to do this. They followed Washington State and Colorado legalizing it. Um, you know that they, they when it was okay to push a little to 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 suggest like DOJ guidelines <laughs> about prosecution without it being any substantial change like then they, when they were good and ready when it, when all their political capital had been spent on other things like running guns to Mexico and giving us some sort of crappy corporate hybrid health care then it was time to cover all the people in jail so right the same with like gay marriage you know after everyone else decided it was okay then Obama kind of sneaks in and is like oh yeah right good. Biden made yeah. it like and meanwhile on election day I still saw like um, I literally can't remember LGBT right now um, for Obama type signs and poor Gary Johnson was running as a Republican and saying he was for gay marriage and everyone was like, Obama and gay people! Yay! Yeah. It was really annoying. <sighs> um, well, and, and you know, uh, uh, much as I might risk the uh, risk being called exploitative by the left when I say this, uh, those Fergusonians, bless them, really do offer a great uh, teaching opportunity for libertarians in that, you know, you get you, you can condemn everything from violent rioters and cigar theft uh, to murderous police and the Department of Homeland Security uh, while reaching out to new constituents at the same time. Uh, so, uh, you know, it really is a wonderful opportunity to teach people force is bad across the board. I think we should go for it. Also, and now all Rand the dead people and police brutality is bad, and so is rioting. And Rand Paul's right in the middle of it. Tail to the end of that, though you were <laughs> wrong. Right. And Rand Paul's going <laughs> to. Condemn all the bad things, and it'll be great, and people will love him forever. I mean, even though he's been less like significantly quality on um, on foreign stuff as he has been on criminal justice, goddamn that drone filibuster just shamelessly excited about a political thing happening. Wished I was in D.C. The most <laughs> embarrassingly non-anarchistic moment where I was just like, oh yes. Politics, like if politics was always like that, I would like, I would pay close attention and be it would it would be awful. So. If he's anti-drone, the next thing he has to do is reach out to uh, Malala, there, the uh, Nobel Prize winner. Yep, coming together. <laughs> well, he's he's backpedaled a little on some of that foreign stuff. Pander to everyone. Pander. <laughs> Lip service. Do I have glaucoma or are you blurry? Uh, I don't know. I might have been blurry for saying okay, so. There you I only have one light. All right. Even though Jordan went away, you guys, um, I, f I don't know. All right. I guess it's my job to be pretend Jordan right now. And I want to talk a little bit about Ayn Rand, not because there's anything particularly um, news topical about that, but because I was entertained by Jordan's blog post where he trashed her. Um, and that, I don't know if you guys read that. I bet you probably didn't, though I said I did. <gasps> Joe! But 
Good boy. I've never read The Fountainhead. I've never read Atlas Shrugged. I've literally. Never, have I. <laughs> I've never read a sentence of Anne Rand. The only thing I know about Anne Rand is that Rush wrote a bunch of songs inspired by her, and they were pretty good. And I know <laughs> most of them on the bass. So, if you guys want to listen to a bass solo of Anthem or Something for Nothing or you know 2112. I can do that, but I cannot. I literally cannot talk about Anne Rand. I have nothing to say about her. I, I, I've read Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, and uh, I guess uh, my only complaint about uh, Ayn Rand really uh, is that uh, she buys into the communist narrative uh, too much. Um, in, in that, uh, the communists basically say, if you don't like big government, it must mean you're a selfish egomaniac. To which she says, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Whereas I would think our best selling point would be convincing people like, no, there are huge utilitarian benefits to everyone from getting rid of the state, and furthermore, the basis of commerce is mutually beneficial exchange. It's always like an, an act of love when you trade with people, uh, not selfish nastiness. Uh, so I think in a way she does herself a disservice by denouncing altruism and calling her book Virtue of Selfishness, even though I fully understand... That's a good title, you know, she's reacting to the trauma of growing up in the Soviet Union and dealing with all of these uh, people who think altruism and socialism do go hand in hand. So I can't blame her, and I think she's better than, you know, 98% of the uh, uh, political activists and philosophers out there, um, but still sounds a little bit more like a sociopath than she had to. <laughs> That's a like great that. summation. I feel like she had a little, like, Ann Coulter in her, where she's just oh, like, yeah. uh, I mean, she's by far, reveling in, like, the... By far. I yeah, mean. she. that's <laughs> what I've gotten from being in the libertarian circles and hearing about her and reading quotes from her. She kind of is just like, yeah, exactly. I'm going to just kind of play up that kind of, you know, so, the, they call me a monster, so that's what I am, you know. So almost as if she lacks nuance, which seems like a pretty basic um, <laughs> yeah, thing so. to get from... But, I mean, that's kind of a, a good way to build up your legacy, too, if you kind of act larger than life and kind of, you know, take the criticisms and kind of run with them. You know, that's kind of a way to, you know, bolster your legend, I guess. And, and even though I'm not an objectivist, I, I'll defend Atlas Shrugged as literature. Uh, in fact, I think if people had thought about it as a Russian novel, since, of course, again, she yeah. grew up in Russia... They would probably find it much more acceptable. I mean, and they would stop dissing the length of it. Yeah, totally. That's a good point. They talk about two or three larger-than-life characters who seem cartoonish and superhero-like, but it's filled with dozens and dozens of characters, uh, and most of them are actually fairly nuanced and morally flawed. They're not just these uh, cartoon cutouts. Um, and I think a lot of people, if they've even read, actually read the novel, uh, which even Joe hasn't. No, no, that's okay. But. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if they've read it, I think they often misremember it as a novel where anyone associated with the government is evil and every businessman is good. But in fact, virtually all the characters, I mean, just numerically speaking, in the cast are corrupt businessmen. They're mm -hmm. crony capitalists. And in fact, I guess I read, I read that novel twice. I read it once in 1989 when the Soviet Union was collapsing. And so oh, I thought, that's a and good so I thought, celebration. Oh, okay. I approve you know, of that. This book may be <laughs> capturing reality. But I read it again in 2009 and actually thought, oh my gosh, this captures the current moment even better because the villains are not Soviets. They are crony capitalists who are constantly talking as if they like commerce but then getting subsidies and regulations in their favor. And if you're going to depict something as big and complicated as a thousand pages worth of uh, bad business subsidies and inept economic policies, uh, you know, I think she managed to do that with a surprising amount of passion. I'd like to see some other writer try to pull off something that big without it seeming a little stiff and cartoonish. Well, well now, now I'm going to have to read it. All right? I'm talking I have you. read the first 30 pages of Atlas Shrugged twice, and I just stopped because <laughs> I was really bored. I have Actually, read it. I just recommend, like, We the Living or Anthem. Anthem is one of my favorites. And I'm not a Nine Rand fan, uh, or, like, some people are. Um, and it is unfortunate that Atlas Shrugged has that kind of negative, you know, view, at least in the mainstream, because it, you know, it has, uh, it has a lot to offer. So you have, in fact, read it, Michelle? No, I did what you did, kind of uh, skimmed through it, and I'm like, this is good. <laughs> I'm going to watch the movie. <laughs> no, no, oh, no, do no yeah. don't watch the movies. No. <laughs> the movies are uh, terrible. I've read the movie. <laughs> 
And I think we probably all know people who were involved in the production of those totally. three little Except films. I feel, I feel I guilty you. saying it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they were they were awful. What uh, the hell were they thinking? I'll changing say the cast yeah. each time is just so awkward. I mean, it's like Doctor Who. It is. You know, it is better that they did it each time. I guess there is sort of a, a more logic to that. Yeah. yeah if we Daggy just made Taggart it, can regenerate. She may be a time lord. <laughs> That's true. Actually, that already helps. That already makes me feel more okay with watching it. Don't watch it. Don't watch it, though. No. No, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> For the love of God. <laughs> I mean, I just, I've always thought, and it's part, like, in some ways, in response to, speaking of being reactionary and lacking nuance, in response to salon-style criticisms that say, oh, libertarians, <laughs> Ayn Rand. Like, I should love Ayn Rand. I wish that I yeah. did, just to spite them. <laughs> but unfortunately, to me, Ayn Rand, from what I've read, which is Anthem and some shorter stuff, and her weird hatred of libertarianism, to me, she's this fake-ass, metaphysical, unprovable, unsubtle version of libertarianism. And then she complained about libertarians stealing her thing, because the 19th century obviously didn't exist. Like, she... Th like. I don't quite get why it's this new thing instead of just a sillier version of our thing. Not to be collectivist. I guess I don't are, know. There are a lot of uh, quasi cult leaders out there who like to make it sound like they invented whatever ideas they're pushing, right? Uh, I mean, like even Jesus was not the first person to say everyone should be nice to each other, <laughs> but you know, it sort of helps uh, promote the cult if you act like you're the only person who ever had that thought. Um, and Rand obviously had a bit of the narcissistic tendency to think she pulled herself up completely by her own bootstraps, uh, not just economically, but uh, uh, philosophically, and, and owes a debt to no one except Aristotle, as she sometimes put it, which is ridiculous. In fact, <laughs> I think she sounds a lot like philosopher Immanuel Kant at times, which uh, is ironic since she thought Kant was the most evil philosopher in all of history <laughs> and was the one responsible for screwing up the modern world. But, I don't know, he wanted a global... Uh, free market order and believe that everyone should be treated as an autonomous unit that was a, it had a purpose unto himself uh, and not as a means to others' ends. Uh, it sounds like Ayn Rand to me. Maybe uh. she thought Kant ripped her off. I mean, if libertarians <laughs> ripped her off and they yeah, time existed travel. long before. Yeah. yeah. She was good at self-promoting, Lucy, right? Unlike you. Yeah, I like Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> I like to channel all my vitriol towards Leonard Peikoff because he, you know, is alive, and usually the um, the lackeys are worse than the uh, originator. I mean, I went to a school whose only claim to fame is that Rachel Carson went there. And uh, as annoying as she is, and how she gave us all malaria, like her, the people who ran with her idea and were like, "Let's ban DDT as, long, as soon as we ban yellow fever from America, and all the Americans are safe." Fuck you, Africa. It's usually the followers who are worse. In a, in a lot of ways. But I've read some really, really unpleasant quotes about foreign policy. Sorry to harp on that, Todd, but uh, I, dead I, people I, bums me out. At the same time, uh, I wouldn't say that foreign policy is clearly uh, a central plank of objectivism, so I'm sure there are, you'll find objectivists who are all over the map on foreign policy. Uh, and also, while there may be some uh, dumb, fanatical followers of Rand, she's also inspired some good political writers and even actual philosophy professors who've added a lot of the nuance that uh, she didn't get around to putting in, so to speak. And, and some musicians, too. Yes. <laughs> I mean, a sprinkling fact. of objectivism, like inspiring libertarians and ANCAPs and stuff, that some of my favorite people have, like, they were influenced by Rand to some extent. They're just not Leonard Peikoff about it, who, again, made Bill O'Reilly sound like a, a, a dove in that one interview. So, like, he's a bad man, and I hate him. And okay. I don't want him in my tent. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I want him to go away. As long as it's your tent, you can exclude whoever you want. That's true. God, I love libertarianism. I love it. Huh. Um, all right, well, we can't, we can't have Jordan defend his um, hilarious mocking of Rand. I've decided he's the only person who's allowed to mock Rand. Well, what, what, uh, how would you summarize his objections? Well, the comparison having... Let's see, let's see, what do I actually know about these things? I read an evangelical blog that was criticizing the insanity of the Left Behind series, you know, about how um, God takes away the, the good people and leaves everyone else behind to have a bad time. 
So I, I kind of know how those books work, and then there's a there's that new movie. Um, no. Yes, with Nicolas Cage, which doesn't sound as hilariously terrible as I'd hoped. But basically, the the comparison between like Left Behind and Atlas Shrugged, where like the you know the good people are gonna leave everybody else behind because fuck you, you didn't listen, you didn't see, and that seems like a reasonable comparison. I mean, Joe style guessing without having actually read the damn things. Um, it's like the Church of the Subgenius saying that on X day, all the people who are in the church will get carried away by the mothership of the alien sex goddesses and everyone else will be left on earth to suffer. Have, have, they, have they said that? Yeah. Have, they set a, have they set a date for that? <laughs> yeah, the, the date uh, was with certainty 1998 <laughs> and, uh, and now they continue to push that idea and just say that uh, the date may have been slightly off um, but, but they're joking. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I do like the Church of the Subgenius. I, mean, I believe they recently said the date may have been upside down, and that <laughs> it might actually be the year 8,661 <laughs> that the aliens will show up. I mean, yeah, most that most people should try that as an excuse. Oh, we just we flipped it. My bad. It's actually infinity. <laughs> Prophecy is tricky. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's rough. Um... Well, you know what? Maybe when I post this podcast, I'll link to Jordan's thing, because I can't fully encapsulate why it amused me. And I, I, was, I was depending on his brainy, too many big words, references <laughs> to people who died 30 years before he was born. <laughs> How does he come up with this stuff? That one? God. I don't know. He's like of the... He's like... I don't know. It's like he's, he's looking at history or something. Um, <laughs> I like history, just not political history, because I hate politics. He's, he's trying too hard. Mm, he pulls it off relatively well, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, he's great, but he's just... <laughs> he's he's, we should he's just talk about him behind all. his back. <laughs> no. He's into this whole thing, so he needs to uh, quit being so smart. He should have a blog I can pronounce. Come he's on, embarrassing dude. you, Lucy. <laughs> anyway, to hell with Jordan Bloom. He's lovely. <laughs> um, I didn't pick a solid like topic of things that are fun, so... Joe, I don't know. What do you think? You're my co-host. Prop me up here. Should we move on to things that we enjoy in the past week or so that are not related to politics at all? Are we ready for that? I think that's uh, a wise decision, oh, leader. No, no, I don't demand some servians. I just just be helpful. Be my Andy Levy. Yes, so no, you're, you're the fire oh, You're the hot chick now who replaced the liberal. And Michelle is supposed to be Andy Levy. That was the rules we set up. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> so you're the hot chick, Joe. So yeah. I'm not sure what that <laughs> means for you exactly. I'll get back to you on that one. We'll okay. we'll tweak this. Okay. All right, Michelle, you haven't. Yeah, you, you need to yell more. You need to interrupt us more. Yeah, <laughs> I've um. Speaking of things that aren't politics, but sort of are. Um, I jumped on the. Peter Thiel, Zero to One uh, Hype Train. I read that book and I've been enjoying it. Or I, I enjoyed reading the book, basically all about um, technological stagnation. And he obviously rips into college and just how terrible it is and how we should go out and do not college <laughs> instead. Um, I don't know, you want me to talk about things I've been enjoying? <laughs> Hockey, Peter Thiel, non political stuff. I've really been out of the loop. I love how everyone just kind of stopped talking about the scary border children that were going to take over America. Um, God and, bless the yeah. media. There's just always something yeah. new to be terrified about, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, want, that <laughs> I wanted some cute toddlers. I'm disappointed. <laughs> well, they're the Ebola toddlers now, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Now it's the ISIS fighters. ISIS with Ebola, with. bringing it in with them. Who left the West, went and picked up Ebola and radicalism, and then came back and are going to sneak through the Mexican border. Right? Ebola suicide bombers, that's what's coming. Ooh, yeah. That's my new really bad imaginary band, I guess. <laughs> Whose topicalness will wane by the time it gets our first <laughs> album together. Um, how, how is Peter Thiel, anyway? Because I feel like his associations with the uh, CIA kind of bum me out sometimes. I know. I, I mean, I wish I could embrace him fully, and I can't. I know. I mean, that book is awesome. <laughs> but yeah, he defends Palantir by saying essentially that 
Uh, he'd rather be working. He trusts himself, obviously. He trusts the people he employs. Um, so he'd rather have that relationship with the government instead of having the government have that relationship with someone less, you know, less dealish. I don't know, dude. Yeah. He, he, he would love... I guess he just... I guess he views himself as a martyr where he, you know, says, I, I want to be the one handing over this information um, to the government to prevent another 9-11. But really, it's it's not a good excuse. Yeah. I don't know. I still, I still don't know how I feel about it, but his book is awesome and has nothing to do with Palantir, really. Or okay. Well, that's good. And it's and a so, Lord of the Rings reference, so that's cool. That's good. That's not. That's never been cool. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh man, good stuff. So that and hockey, right? That's that's your life. Yeah, yeah, and not being an intern. Not being an cool. intern. Yeah. Um, Joe, what have you been enjoying in the past week or so of your life? Well, it's since our last podcast, which is like five months ago, or whatever. Well, <laughs> Shut <laughs> up! I'm uh, hoping they won't notice. Doing a lot of video games. Uh, I got obsessed with Destiny, even though it's not great. I can't stop playing it. Uh, it's I taking it my is. life and preventing me from doing anything productive with the stag blog or anything else. Mm. Other than that, uh, my band recorded a video on top of the Steel Tower, which is so. The tallest building in Pittsburgh, and it's going to be pretty cool, and we have an album coming out, and a CD release party in two weeks and a day. You can put this shit on. We have a blog for this, Joe. I know. Is my rambling about Charlie Parr and nuclear apocalypse any more relevant to libertarianism than your band? Is it, Joe? I've been playing a lot of video games, and I don't have time. All right. (laughs) I'm a level 24 (laughs) titan. i got to save the galaxy. This is... That's, this is why I don't understand video games because I just can't spend that much time on wasting my time on one thing. I have to waste my time on many, many small things. So <laughs> I don't just, even I'm have more to focus than you are, Lucy. Right? <laughs> on your time wasting. Yes. Indeed. What have I been enjoying? Okay. Well, I've been enjoying <laughs> this shirt because I have to. It's beautiful. It's like a space <laughs> alien, and he's eating cotton candy out of the Capitol building, and like the military is assaulting him, and he's really just cheerfully indifferent to it. And wow. I, it's really just like a fundamental summation of all that I believe in this world. So I really like my new shirt. <laughs> um, Let's see. I also I read some books so that I could restart my brain. I read Gone Girl, which was actually pretty damn good, and I'm pretty picky about fiction. Um, and I started reading as well. Yeah, is it? Yep. I am um, usually not disappointed. I'm usually disappointed by anything that's like a mystery, even like Philip Marlowe and like The Thin Man, really classic stuff. It's usually more about like the journey. But I was satisfied with like the depressing bleakness and slightly unrealisticness of Gone Girl, so that was fun. Um, and I started reading a short story compilation called The End is Nigh, which has many fun stories about like the brink of the end of the world, and I'll probably describe that on the Stag blog soon. So the usual things that I enjoy, end of the world mostly. To- Todd, share with the class, what do you like lately that is not related to politics? Let's see. Uh... A strange New York performance artist named Reverend Jan uh, oh, stop. Loaned, loaned, me a, loaned me a biography of okay. Fellini, <laughs> which turned out to be uh, a lot of fun. And Fellini seems like a really fun guy, even though he, he admits he constantly cheated on his wife, which is not cool. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, it was sort of refreshing to see that even though he's one of those guys that always gets taught in extremely uh, theoretical film classes, uh, it doesn't yeah, sound like he cares reference. about it. Yeah. It doesn't sound like he cares about any of that. So in the book, he doesn't say anything like, oh, I wanted to challenge people's conception of the mise-en-scene. Uh, by having uh, the dwarf in the first scene, he instead just says stuff like, oh, I loved living in Rome, and there was a short little man. I said, someday I'll make a movie. I put a short man in my movie. Oh, that's, that's way better. You're right. Yeah. yeah he's just good. seemed like a pretty normal guy who dreamt of running away with the circus when he was a kid and vowed that when he made movies, he would put lots of strange characters in them. So... Relatively straightforward, and sounds like he was having a good time, uh, so that's nice. Uh, do we dare even broach the UFO topic, or 
Is that, oh God, dude, so much to G give us say, a, give us a teaser about your love of UFOs, and well, then I swear to God we'll ramble for a solid hour soon. I I, I, I have to I have to preface this by saying that my entire adult life I've been a, a both an anarcho capitalist and, I swear and <laughs> uh, and a hardcore skeptic like uh, Penn and Teller or James Randi. So I don't believe in God, ghosts, psychic powers, uh, fate, horoscopes, werewolves, uh, Bigfoot. <laughs> Atlantis, <laughs> any of it, uh, nor alien abductions. However, uh, another book I did read recently was uh, UFOs by Leslie Keen. Uh, at the urging of some friends of mine who are fairly intelligent, kept saying, I'm telling you, there's more there than you think there is. And uh, to my surprise, uh, although none of the like crazy abduction stories or any of the really wild things uh, seem to have any evidence for them, uh, there have been so many odd lights in the sky, sometimes in geometric patterns, that apparently virtually every major government on Earth has at some point had their Air Force or military investigate them. And basically they all came to the conclusion that they're real, there are lights flying around that buzz our airplanes and our military bases. We don't know what they are. They move faster than any of our planes do. And that's all we know. And we have nothing else to say about it. And there's not really anything we can do. And they've and and I I always used to think as a skeptic like oh I don't want to hear about any of this nonsense unless there mm -hmm. are well corroborated cases with hundreds of independent witnesses and radar tracks and so mm -hmm. forth and it turns out they exist <laughs> it's sort of embarrassing but <laughs> they exist and uh, the only reason the U S government I guess hasn't been as forthcoming really is <clears throat> it is sort of a case of uh, tiny bureaucratic decisions having long term consequences basically back around the forties. Uh, the U.S. government decided, like, okay, we're going to divide the cases into two types. The ones that are pretty easily debunked, because it seems like they could just be seagulls or misperceived meteors or whatever. Uh, you know, or military balloons from other militaries. And then, in the other category, we'll put the ones that we really can't come up with a good explanation for and that seem fairly well corroborated. And they kind of adopted the schizophrenic policy of constantly talking about the debunk debunkable cases while pretending the other ones don't exist. But They're by point, making conspiracy theorists go insane. Exactly. Sure. Uh, More insane. Uh, and occasionally even deploying disinformation agents uh, to spew nonsense about uh, what those cases were. Actually, with the classic example being Roswell, where it appears, that for, it, it is a matter of historical fact, crazy as it sounds, that the first press release issued by the military itself said, we've captured a crashed alien flying saucer. Now, they didn't say alien, did it? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know if they use the word alien, but they definitely said uh, flying a flying saucer. And it was at a time when there had been many sightings that people thought were aliens, so they knew exactly how it would be taken. Right. Uh, then, uh, I think, uh, basically, the truth probably is a, it was a military spy balloon. Uh, so at first they thought, like, we'll just let the flying saucer story stand, because that'll cover up uh, the military balloon. And then within a day, they decided, oh, crap, that's, a, that's attracting entirely too much attention, so we need to put out another cover story, which was the mere weather balloon. Uh, everybody in the town, I didn't realize this until recently, Roswell is filled with military people, so they all knew that's no weather balloon. So then for 70 years, you've got people <laughs> saying, like, this cover story is bullshit. Uh, but the truth at the bottom of it all is probably just a military balloon rather than the flying saucer. But the communications officer who put out the initial press release saying it's an alien ship believed until his dying day it was an alien ship. And the whole town, including all these military people, was filled during the period this was going on with rumors that it actually was an alien ship and that the military was hiding bodies. So you kind of can't blame people in the town for the fact that to this day some of them still say, oh, yeah, it was a cover-up, but they're going to bump us off if we talk about it, so, like, keep your mouth <laughs> shut. And I've, I know a guy whose family grew up there, and he said that, like, they all assume it's aliens, basically. They all believe that. Uh, so there's something, something mysterious in the sky. That is, you're, you're, I mean, I'm you're, you're putting yourself down on for, for something mysterious. That one, that one may just be, that, it, it may just be blimps. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> interestingly... Blimps uh, don't go that quickly, though. Like, I, not, yeah, yeah, well, uh, many of them might be blimps, and then some of them are genuinely mysterious. Like, I wouldn't be shocked at this point if we someday find out nothing has visited us from other planets, but ball lightning can become as smart as an amoeba, and, and like, you know, may maybe they can buzz airplanes or something. I don't know. I, I, I suspect there's something weird we're missing that explains some of these cases anyway. And, you know, it'd just be intellectually dishonest of me not to admit 
that I'm a little freaked out by some of this information because I know, you know, I could much more easily maintain my decades-long skeptical cred by dismissing it all, but I don't know, I think there's something weird there. Well, we're going to, in the future, fully destroy your reputation as a skeptic oh, okay. by indulging all of your paranoid 3 a.m. impulses on this subject. We truly are. Um, now I'm going to wrap it up. Joe, should we promote oh. you in some way? Promote me? What do you, promote, right, you know how this it. works. It hasn't been that long, God damn it. All right, uh, go to activeparn.com and check out my band's new stuff. And the there show. you go. None of these people are in Pittsburgh. Don't no. tell them we live in Pittsburgh. It's a secret. Right. They can't know. All right, yes, activepardon.com. That's good. Yeah. The stag blog. I will pretend to be Jordan. You should read Jordan Bloom's writing because um, it's really good. He's the opinions editor for the Daily Caller, and you should look at his stuff there. And his blog I will link to, and I, I can't. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't remember what word it is. It's... It's Mili Militarus or something. Yeah. yeah keep. <laughs> I, think, I think it's Mitreus. Mi Militarus would be uh, what, you know, when, the, when the army takes it over and turns it into a blog that Lucy really hates. That's why I didn't read his piece. I spent like five minutes trying to figure out the URL. I'm just this, right. is, this is rough. Like, right. Right. This is enough intellectual simulation for... <laughs> just Terrible. reading the URL is enough. You're like, I learned a lot today. Terrible for yeah. SEOs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michelle, do you have things to promote to the world? Uh, I think I always promote Fee at the end. They're awesome. <laughs> Check them out. <laughs> I think they uh, don't work there the anymore. The Freeman posts awesome articles. Dan Beer, who is a good friend of, I think, a lot of us, um, recently uh, wrote an article on, um, you know, kind of cop debt. And uh, you also write some awesome stuff on cops that everyone should check out. So I'm going to put you on blast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. The third tier, Radley Balco, at this rate. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or second tier. <laughs> so yeah, I promote you and then Fee and then people who are awesome. That's it. Yes. Fee is awesome. Um, Dan Beer is awesome. So many things are awesome. Todd. Yeah. Uh, if everything goes according to plan, I might actually uh, sort of disappear. Uh, from the internet uh, for a few months so I can work on a couple of uh, ghost writing uh, book projects which would be more or less libertarian but more than more than that I shouldn't say mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know whatever else I do it'll be mentioned on toddcv.com uh, somewhere often over in the right hand margin where I list what events I'll be doing and I'll probably amongst them will probably be me making occasional on stage performances here in New York City uh, at these uh, political discussion events called electoral dysfunction, uh, where people try to talk about politics while being funny. Not so um, unlike the video we have just yeah. done. <laughs> Hooray for us! Yay! And we didn't even have to go to New York City, which is a terrible place. Just kidding. No. The last two good. trips there were really crappy. Just because um, the mayor is a communist doesn't make it unlivable. There are many problems in New York City, many conflicting feelings. It's like a hot chick who's fun, but I don't know. She's just a little full of herself. Something like that. <laughs> um, I just started writing for a weird sort of clickbaity, and it's okay because they admit that website called Politics, spelled with an X. I don't really know what I'm doing there yet, but it's a good exercise in just writing more stuff. Um, and as usual, you can read me at rareandantiwar.com. Screw you, Todd. Just kidding, I like you. Um, Vice and the Stag Blog, which all of you in the world should give me guest blogs for so that I don't have to not have posts when I'm lazy and Joe is busy. Where did Joe go? He went away, didn't he? I don't know. Well, I have to ditch too, so. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for watching. Right, bye. For people who hate politics. Bye, Michelle. Bye, Joe. And bye, Todd. And bye, Jordan. You slacker. <laughs>